Okay, so we're very lucky to have the Dean of the School of Computing, Engineering and the Built Environment. Uh, hello, Peter. Hi, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, no problem. Would you just like to introduce yourself to um, our, our listeners? Sure. So I'm Peter Anders. I'm a professor, uh, professor of computer science. Uh, I work at Edinburgh Napier University since uh, August 2021, so just a bit over two years ago I started here. Uh, I am the Dean of the School of Computing, Engineering and the Built Environment, as Bill said. Uh, previously, just about a year ago, I was still a Dean of two schools, separately Computing and separately Engineering and the Built Environment. And since I joined, that was my first task to join the two schools together and become a Dean of the Joint School. Uh, previously, I worked at uh, the Kiel University. Uh, there I was the head of school of the School of uh, Mathematics and Computer Science. Uh, before that, I worked at uh, Newcastle University, uh, where I was a reader and previous lecturer and so on, um, in the School of Computing, and uh, even before that, in the uh, Department of Psychology. Uh, between 2000 and 2002. So, you know, before that, I was in Netherlands for about two years, and before that, I was in Romania. I am a Hungarian from Romania, um, and then I, I did my degrees back in Romania uh, in Kolozsvár at the Babesboy University. Okay, that's amazing. So let's wind back. Let's go right back to your roots in, in Transylvania and in Hungary and your, your childhood. What what interests you as a, as a child? Well, you know, uh, I was always very interested in, uh, if you like, abstract things, certainly numbers. That was uh, quite early on something that I was interested in. Uh, then came uh, geography. In a, so this was a long time ago, when I was about nine, then I learned the geography of the world, and I still can remember in fine details. <laughs> so I can draw uh, maps of the world or parts of the world. Um, and then I got interested in history, and then really more properly mathematics. Uh, so I was about 12 when I, the first time I came among the top five in a mass competition. And then after that, I was winning mass competitions. Uh, and then, you know, I also enjoyed very much physics and chemistry. And so at that time, there were these um, Olympiads. Uh, there were years when I won at the county level, both math, you know, mathematics, physics, and chemistry as well. So you know, I, I, that started quite early my interest in that. And of course, programming. Um, so then I was about, I think, um, I was about 15 when I read first the first um, basic book. And I learned programming in basic. I, I, I did not have a computer at that time yet. But I learned uh, how to write the code. And then about half a year later, I got the computer. Because the one that I learned that was a Commodore basic, then I got the Spectrum uh, ZX. And then I learned the Spectrum ZX basics. And, uh, and it, that that's really where my computer science uh, interest started. And so of course, I was interested in quite a lot in mathematics, various aspects, computation aspects of mathematics, like fractals and dynamical systems. So, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, someone who does cryptography, I spend half my life looking at prime numbers and, and discrete logs and so on. So I, I've rediscovered my love of maths. I spent a little bit of time away from it, and I really regret that period. Uh, when when I moved from engineering into computer science, I got less into maths. Mm. Uh, I've, I've managed to get back into the, what, what it is I really love. And it's great to hear you say that, that uh, you had, as a Commodore 64, is that? Yes, that, it's right? a, that, that was what I learned. Actually, what I had was a Spectrum ZX. Oh, the terrible uh, keyboard. Yes, the keyboard was not great. 
But you know, cassettes. I lived in Romania, um, in Transylvania, <clears throat> and there uh, the computer that was available was a copy of the ZX. It was called H- oh. HC81. Oh. Um, you know, they basically copied the ZX processors and everything else. So that was, that was a good fit uh, there to learn uh, programming them. Yeah, there, there was a computer before that called the ZX80 and the ZX81, yeah. which had 1K of, of I, memory. I, I, was I did yeah. program on the ZX81. Uh, my uh, maths teacher had a ZX81. <laughs> and uh, I was very interested in FRAC. So I wrote a code in meshing code uh, to make it fast. <laughs> yeah, that must have been difficult to do that. Uh, I always find that when you yeah, I really program... enjoyed it. See, see, I, I enjoyed low level programming very much at that time. So. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. So your first computer was the, the proper one was the copy of the. Yeah. Yeah, the, actually, I had a, I had at home the proper ZX at yeah. the in at the school we had the copies of the ZX. Yeah, in the UK we had the BBC Micro. That was the big mm. computer. It had a proper keyboard at the time, and that was the one that got school kids. And it's a shame that we don't really have that type of computer now to really engage kids as 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 it was then. Yeah, me, then, it's quite interesting. Yeah. I remember I wrote my first game uh, on the ZX where it was just characters because that was the easiest way to manage them on uh, the screen. And and your first proper computer, what, what was that? Well, the first proper computer was a bit later. It was in 1990 when I had a PC. Uh, you know, at that time it was just a PC. It was a yeah. 286 PC. Oh, yeah. Uh, which I had at the, in my office. I I started working quite early on uh, in parallel with my university news organizations and other organizations. And there, there I had uh, the computer. Of course, at the university as, as well, we had computers. But then that was a long time ago. So I remember the first operating system that I learned was the CPM. And then... CPM, yeah. And then after that, the DOS and then Linux. Right. Yeah, CPM was quite an amazing uh, operating system. I think it tried to bring all the gaming machines together yeah. because it was different processors. And I think CPM language was trying to, you could run a program on the 6802 and the <laughs> Z80 and, and, and so on. I think it was Sony who, who promoted it at the time. Yeah, to me, I, you know, that was the first kind of, uh, operating system were, that was available, and in you know, the university we learned that as yeah. the kind of introductory. And, and I remember um, we still had the eight-inch floppy disk, which were really floppy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> how, how big? What was it? Eight-inch. Eight eight, eight eight-inch. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's yeah. massive. I remember yeah. five-inch and three point yeah, five. Yeah, five-inch came. Five and quarter-inch came after that. Oh, oh, they they are really big. They, yeah. they, that that usually goes into a, a, a mini or a micro computer, yeah. as, as I yeah. remember. Absolutely terrible technology, <laughs> and it cost a fortune. I always remember running a a Vax eleven, I think it was, for the department, yeah. Yeah. and it was costing fifteen thousand pound a year, and this was in the nineteen eighties, which was yeah. so much money, and. And I had to uh, migrate to this PC network, and there was people that weren't very happy because microcomputers were proper computers. <laughs> and these were just like little toys. So it was a difficult decision, but I think it was the it was the right one at the time. Yeah. And your mum and dad, what 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 did what? what, what yeah, my did they do? father was a cardiologist, yeah, a doctor. Wow. And my mother is a dentist. She worked as a dentist. Uh, All right. So the natural route was to go into medicine. I would oh, yes, think indeed. For you. Uh, <laughs> and that was my original plan to go into medicine. In fact, uh, the only thing was uh, that turned me away from medicine was that uh, so this is Romania uh, in the nineteen yeah. eighties when I was in high school. And I am a Hungarian from Romania, belonging to Hungarian minority, and it was a quite strict numerous clauses applied to 
blue and medicine in particular. So although I, I prepared until I was about 17, I was thinking I would go to medicine, but just realized that I could not learn uh, kind of word by word three books well enough to be in the top five, uh, also including those who might have had connections. So then I decided that uh, since I was unlikely to get into medicine in those in that context, then I would go to do computer science, and kind of second option. <laughs> must have I was quite sure a... that I would get in there because I was yeah. going to mass yeah. competitions. I was every year I went to the national. Uh, phase out the math, mass competition. I was quite good at it. And for computer science, the exam was the same as the maths exam. So we had algebra, geometry, uh, and um, what was it? Uh, analysis, uh, the calculus. Uh, so we had three exams, entrance exams. And... Yeah, it must have been quite a new subject at the time. And oh, yes. I think it was, in the, in it the was year evolving. when I I did my admission exam to the university. You see, it was different there. So, you know, you, you did your A levels equivalent, the baccalaureate, and then you had to do the second exam, admissions exam. And, uh, and at that time, it was a small part of the population, of the Dutch population who would go to university or something like three to five percent. So, it was really quite selective. Mm. And in the year when I uh, went to, to do the, my admission, there were only 20 students admitted at the Babesh Boye to the computer science uh, program. Um, the year after, so after I did my admissions exam, I had to go to the army uh, as a conscript. So I spent there uh, some time. And then the year after I started actually my university, by that time they increased to 100 places, the computer science program. So when I started, we were 100 and Hundred ten or something like that on the program. That's amazing. And then, why did you go into academia and not go into industry? So, you, what was your route through through university? You know, as I said, I got involved quite early on in politics. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that comes again with the background that you know, my parents knew. The um, you know, dissidents in Romania. So you know, that, that kind of prepared many people, including myself, to think about politics during communism. And of course, then when communism fell uh, in the, the end of 89, uh, that was a great thing, but that also meant that I got interested in politics. So I joined first a youth organization. And through that, I got involved in politics. And in parallel with my university studies, I carried on working in politics. And I also founded a non-profit organization, a foundation, essentially a kind of think tank to support local governments and regional development. I was the director of this organization. There was 21 and I became the director. I managed through my political connection to raise the funding for it. Uh, so we started with five people, and then when I left six years later, we had about 35 permanent employees and about 100 plus uh, kind of contractors. And so you know, that, that was um, that. That's my second job. Before that, I was leading a youth organization, uh, Information Office, National Office. Uh, uh, for a bit more than a year. So you know, that, that kind of impact with my studies, that was my interest. And at that time, I was thinking that probably I would go into politics. Uh, and and I did try. Uh, I kind of, you know, the party where I belonged, that the, 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 the ethnic Hungarian party in Romania, and I was in the liberal branch of that. So they got into government in 96, and um, I was among the people who were considered for ministerial positions. Um, in the end, I got shuffled out in the last minute. Um, and I, you know, I, you know, I, at that time, I was looking at the Ministry of Public uh, 
kind of reform of public services, uh, uh, public service. Uh, and then later I was looking at another position in the government, kind of cabinet office uh, minister role. Then uh, when I didn't get that, I said, I'm getting a bit old uh, to get into science. Uh, perhaps I should defer science uh, before I do more in politics. Uh, so by that time, I already uh, was doing my PhD, but then I decided to focus on that and finish that. Got a science related job at the University of Maastricht and then at uh, Newcastle University later in 2000. Um, and ever since I am in science, uh, I am still a bit in politics as well. You know, in, uh, I left Romania in 98. It took me until 2008 until I really relinquished my all, all my connections uh, in politics there. Uh, when I stepped down from the board of this foundation that I um, funded, and but again here I got involved with the Liberal Democrats quite early on. Um, I stood for the parliament uh, since 2010 in every general election. Of course, you know, I stood in places where I did not have a real chance of winning. Yeah. Uh, as a Liberal Democrat, that's not that difficult. Uh, <laughs> Just the south of yes. England. <laughs> My best result I got then in 2010 when I was standing in Washington at Sunderland West. Ooh, I got difficult. about close to 20% of the vote. But, you know, that, that was that was a year for, when the Lib Dems got into government yeah. Yeah. with the Tories, yeah. and, uh, you know, Lib Dems were really up. Uh, yeah. That was the time when Lib Dems yeah. said that, well, there would be no tuition fee, and a little bit later they changed yeah. their position, which really yeah. pushed them back. Anyway, so it was at a good time for Lib Dems when I got almost 20% of the vote there. Now, ever since I was probably under 5% every time when I stood. Well, you know, <coughs> for a bit um, between 2011 and 2014, I was a local councillor in Newcastle at the time. Also, again, as a Lib Dem local councillor. So, you know, I got a bit involved. My priority was science and research, not that much the politics. The politics was rather the hobby. Yeah. I, th I think to be a dean, you've got to be a politician. <laughs> and you've got to understand uh, lots of different sides of, I mean, of, that's of true, something. That, you know, it helps a lot. That, yeah. that experience that, you know, yeah. because, you know, especially between 1990 and 98 when I was quite deeply involved in politics. And then, yeah, yeah, because you know, I could see many things. It was a kind of lucky situation at the right time, right place. Um, that I learned a lot of how to work with other people, how to manage organizations. And I set up an organization, I grew it. I was involved in regulations of this uh, Hungarian ethnic party as well, quite deeply uh, changed the I, I led a good example changing of their regulations. So, yeah, it was an interesting work. I was quite young. I, I was in my 20s at that time. Uh, but that gave me the opportunity to learn a lot uh, from how you work in organization, how you manage them, how you relate to other organizations, how you manage people with power. Okay. Yep, yep. So you went from the Netherlands to England and now Scotland. So why, why the UK? Why, why, why Scotland? Why you know, are you now? Really, I was looking for an English-speaking country because what I realized is that the Anglo-Saxon academia is much more meritocratic and much more performance-driven and much more open than the continental European academia. Um, so, so then I did apply to the UK. I applied to places in the US. The one that I got, actually the first one that I got was at Imperial in London in conjunction with a, a financial company, the um, National Cash Register, NCR. Unfortunately, uh, that was back in uh, September 99. Unfortunately, they messed up the 
paperwork. So they had to re-advertise the position. By the time they re-advertise and processes moved on, I got a job at Newcastle. And the job at Newcastle was for three years. The job at the Imperial was for one year only. So I said that uh, I will stay at Newcastle for a three-year position. And then I got stuck there for a long time. And your research, what what's, what do you think the fundamental thing that you're trying to solve in, in your research? I know being a dean is a very busy time. And, yes. And, and it's difficult to really concentrate on, on other things, but in the yeah. back of your head. Going back to the origins of my research, uh, as I said, first I was interested in fractals and kind of uh, in how the world is organized. And then I got interested in AI, in neural networks, and I did my undergraduate uh, dissertation on that. But then as I was learning more about it, kind of, and also learning more about the brain as well, when, when I was in Maastricht, I was at the opportunity to see more of, the, of that work. Then I realized that you know, the AI, the artificial neural networks, are quite far away from the biological ones. So <clears throat> that kind of led me to try to understand the biological neural networks and also to look at the artificial neural networks in the context of that. So what does it mean that they are artificial? So I, I understood quite well their mathematics. So I wrote my PhD thesis mainly about the mathematical analysis of neural networks. At that time, uh, also about the support vector machines, those were of coming out in the late 90s, uh, the main, main methodology. So I got very much interested in that. <clears throat> but having this <clears throat> uh, understanding from the biological end as well made me quite critical about uh, the artificial neural networks. So I could see that you know, there's quite a lot of hype when people talk about how similar are these to the brain. While actually, what's the core underlying thing is very much a mathematical theory, uh, which is a mathematical theory, but should be treated as as such, not as an analog of something that we don't understand. <clears throat> so, so anyway, <clears throat> this was around two thousand, and then I looked for a nervous system that I could study, because what I realized within about two years was that. Well, you know, I, I was working in a neuroscience um, unit in a psychology department. And what I realized is that, you know, we record a lot of data and we throw most of it out because it doesn't fit the what you want to record. So I was looking for a system which is small enough, simple enough, that can be analyzed so I could gather some better understanding of what is happening in biological systems so I can then understand better what I need to do in the artificial system to make it more similar in some sense. So that's what led me to the analysis of the crab stomatogastric ganglion. Um, I spent like, quite a lot of time setting up a lab, which I set up in 2007. And then I published the first paper on it in 2010, thanks to collaboration with colleagues from uh, Ulm. Uh, he, he, my colleague, um, Wolfgang uh, is now uh, Wolfgang Stein. Uh, he is in the, uh, at the Illinois State University in the U.S. now. Uh, the professor there. Uh, so you know, we were then. <clears throat> you know, that was really new. I mean, you know, the technology that we use was voltage sensitive eye optical imaging, um, which has been around since the. 90s, but it hasn't been applied to this particular nervous system. So my lab was the first which applied it. <clears throat> and then um, you know, it was an interesting thing to see how the real neurons work, try to understand how that works, and put it in the context of the artificial ones. So in the artificial neuron context, really one of my first, I think, quite interesting result was the combination of the support vector machines with a self-organizing map. So I brought that in 19. I actually got it published in 2002, I think. But I was among the first who worked on that integration as well. 
So anyway, on one side, I had quite good understanding of the mathematics of neural networks. On the other side, I had an increasingly good understanding of the biology of the biological neural systems. And really, my interest was on that boundary of, of computer science, mathematics, and biological systems. And so I tried to, at that time, what I tried to do was to understand how these biological systems work and how can I use that understanding to make the artificial um, mathematical theory of neural networks more effective. Now, I mean, I got involved in various other things as well. Uh, so that was a time when I got involved in uh, molecular biology. Um, kind of, it was an offshoot from this impasse uh, that uh, that time my um, the guy who I worked with as a postdoc when I moved to Newcastle initially, um, he was interested in network analysis of the brain, but then. We got into the network analysis of the protein interaction networks. So I learned proteomics and protein interaction networks. And we founded a company which um, ended up on the stock exchange in 2007. Wow. And ever since it's there, um, at the peak, it was worth about 200 million pounds. Now it's much less. Uh, oh, dear. <laughs> uh, you know, I had a small share. In, in, initially, I had about one. Just one percent of it, but then you know, it was again it's an interesting experience to be involved in setting up a spin-out company, getting it to the point where it got uh, the stock exchange. You know, I wasn't involved that much in getting funding. My colleague uh, was doing most of that, but I was there in the background supporting that. So anyway, this was a kind of sideways, but again, it led to a very interesting understanding because you know, I. Through my neuroscience interest, I got into the network analysis of the brain and then network analysis of various other things. Um, but that also helped to understand of the limitations of the artificial neural networks, mm -hmm. but also of the functionality of how the, these biological systems work. So, so now, ever since, that's, that's really my interest on one side. I'm interested in the kind of rigorous mathematical understanding of the neural of, of the artificial neural systems, which of course implies also understanding the limitations of it. On the other side, I am quite interested in understanding the biological uh, neural systems, and in general, how biological systems work. So you know, that was another branching out of this interest that I, uh, with a colleague at Newcastle University, we wrote a series of lectures uh, on evolution of complex systems. Um, and actually during COVID, I finally recorded them. I put them up on the uh, mm. internet as well, my lectures. Mm, I'm not saying that they are particularly popular, <laughs> but there is, I think it, it is good to have them. On a, until then, I had only just a lecture. So it, it is kind of, I mean, if you like, it's a kind of hand wavy analysis and interpretation of complex systems in the view of various mathematical theories and whatever I learned about biological systems in various contexts. So, so anyway, what I'm interested in right now, uh, on one side, is the continuation of this work of, in particular, deep learning right now. But why is it working as it does? Because it's kind of paradoxical. Because on one side, the classic learning theories from the 80s and 90s say that if you have too many parameters, then you overfit, and that's not good. On the other side, uh, the kind of W learning curve uh, that is more. Um, so, uh, so, the, uh, so, on one side, um, you have this theory that you shouldn't overfit. On the other side, you have the practical results that you overfit and you generate good results. But that is also mixed with the various results of the counter examples of the adversarial attacks on uh, machine learning and so on. So, so anyway, that's, I mean, 
don't have a solution. Nobody has yet uh, a, a really good understanding of how does this work. When in one more recent work, I haven't published it yet, the paper is almost finalized, is, is looking at the kind of same W uh, style learning curves, but in the context of support vector machines. And if I can work on that sufficiently, that potentially gives a way of understanding better the, the, the deep learning networks as well. Uh, so that's that's one of my interests. Another thing, um, again, quite similar to this, um, I looked at support vector machines and their statistical reliability, which I published um, recently of the few rejections. And, and again, uh, what I find is that you know, if people don't control enough for the complexity of the algorithm or of the of the of the model of the machine learning model that they build, then potentially they get spuriously good results. Um, I, I have a, another similar work again, not yet published, on looking at a nearest neighbor uh, learning um, and nearest neighbor classifiers and showing that if you combine sufficiently many of these with sufficient transformations in the background, then you can get performance comparable to deep learning. That's interesting. And, so uh, that's, you know, that's my kind of more machine learning theoretical interests. On the other side, my interest in uh, the biological systems continues. Um, on the neuroscience side, um, I mean, one thing that I realized at one moment, uh, maybe about eight years ago, about, uh, was that you know, until around the late um, 80s, early 90s, uh, their work was focused on understanding the anatomy of neural systems. And it was expected that if you know the anatomical connectivity plus each of the neurons, then you understand the system. And because at that time, late 80s, when there was a paper published about the stomatogastric ganglion, which showed that neuromodulation actually changes a lot, changes functionality of, of the anatomical networks. Then 92 major book was published uh, on this uh, neural system, uh, summarizing the results up to then. And I have said that since then, so the last 30 years, have been spent on trying to understand how a neuromodulation works in this simple system. And you know, we still not really know. Uh, now, my method gives a kind of new way uh, of understanding system scale behavior, but still, there's so much that we don't know about how neuromodulation works. However, more recently, like, uh, last five years, there are many other results coming out showing that neuromodulation indeed changes how neurons work. And it looks like a single neuron, although it is to some extent defined what it can do, what kind of functions can it take, there is a range of uh, functional variability. And depending on the context, a neuron may switch between these uh, potential functions that it can take on. So really understanding uh, the neuron anatomy and the individual neurons is not enough. We need much more to understand about how uh, neural systems work. So that's that's still my interest. I mesh, but you know, that's in order to progress is that I need to operate my lab, my uh, it's very time consuming to operate. Ideally, I need a PhD student or postdoc. I will need to apply for funding for that. Uh, my last postdoc left in 2019, just before COVID. Uh, so, I, at one moment, I will get back to that and continue that research as well. And uh, to mention my final current interest is that it goes back to the kind of understanding of biological systems from mathematical angle, and I will be having PhD students working on an algebraic theory and algebraic modeling of uh, molecular interaction systems in living systems, which is part of my earlier work on understanding complex systems and the evolution of complex systems. This is kind of first step in it, how molecular interactions add together to develop into a living system. Now, 
perhaps that that far we will not go with these PhD projects, but we will come up with a new way of modeling how molecular interactions can be captured and computation modeled uh, in a better way than current on stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting. And I mean, obviously, the brain is an analog computer, and probably that's yeah. why it's so, so complex. We're trying to model it in a digital way. And mm. if you go back to uh, the kind of classics of Shannon learning and the Turing test, then computers pass all these tests. Now they can go up yeah. to the highest level, they can beat us at chess, uh, they can start to reason but there's still nothing can compete with with the human brain so tell me the good and the bad the 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 sin and the devil when it comes to ai what's going to be the devil the devil within and what's going to be the saint the savior of our society yeah you know i think the devil is um the devil in a sense uh it's the military application mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, because the AI is good enough to do many things. It doesn't do perfect. As I said, you can come up with these adversarial examples and that kind of breaks it. However, in many contexts, it will function reasonably well uh, for sufficiently simple tasks. And some of these have, obviously, uh, applications in military contexts as well. Now, on one side, I think that working on the military applications is a necessity because if one country doesn't do that, then it will just stay behind others who do it. So understanding it and seeing what is possible and what's not, how, where are the limits, that's important. I saw that there is already talk about discussing the limits or kind of uh, treaty-like limitations on uh, military applications of AI. I don't know how far that will go, certainly in the context of nuclear uh, uh, months, uh, that treaty approach worked until now. But I think that the, I don't think that AI will become anything comparable to uh, nuclear bombs. However, uh, it will be, if it is applied, it can be a very effective way of killing people or uh, destroying uh, the town's uh, infrastructure and so on. But I think that if you want, as the evil part of it, that, that's where I see uh, the most evil potential applications of it. On the good side? Yeah. And the good side, the saint, for the thing that's going to save society. <laughs> yeah, I think that it it has many many positive applications. So in the, in the same way, there are many relatively routine tasks where AI can deal with the task. So um, I have a PhD student uh, who works at the company, and we are looking at ways of automating assembly lines. And I just read an article in The Economist about a similar in a context of a different company. And yeah, that, that's a big thing. Uh, to, to this company that they were writing about in The Economist, they were saying that previously they had 70 people on the assembly line. Now they have seven. And it's much more productive, makes much less errors and so on. And I think that these kind of applications are very positive. You know, if you look at medical applications, you know, I don't expect that it will replace the doctors. I, we are very far from that. However, assisting a doctor, that that can can be done already very well. Uh, simply, you know, pointing to the parts of an X-ray or pointing to the parts of you know blood readings and whatever. Uh, data is there, which are most likely to be informative for the doctor to make a judgment. Um, but, you know, really, in many other areas, I mean, if you look at chat GPT, yeah, I think it, I talk to uh, people and they say that it does help uh, 
generating initial text or initial code, for example, in the context of programming. Now, it's not good code. So what we need to realize is that ChatGPT uses whatever is on the internet, on GitHub. Now, yeah. People upload on GitHub a lot of stuff, mostly yeah. low-quality code. So if the ChatGPT learns from that, what learns is not the best programming practice. However, for sufficiently simple tasks, for sufficiently well-formulated questions, it, it can provide a good initial code that the user then can work on and improve and make it much better. I was talking to somebody who said that you know, they don't know one of the newer programming languages. Then they use the chat GP to, to generate for them the initial text because the you know, syntax wise is correct, so they don't need to pay that much attention. Well, so I see that in many other similar ways, the, the AI will be able to provide uh, the kind of service that deals with the routine tasks. Now, in a similar way as previous rounds of automation did the same at different scale. So in, in that sense, I think that the AI can do a lot and will uh, bring benefits. Clearly, in a, in a sense, it will replace some jobs, but I think it will create many more jobs than the number of the jobs that it is replacing. Yeah. And obviously, large language models are looking to create template answers, so like a stack overflow type approach, and they've obviously been reviewed by humans, and it's really just filling in the gaps with probabilities. So the probability yeah. that uh, you're talking about a city is Edinburgh or, or Glasgow and, and so on. And obviously, that's not a precise science that's probability and, and it will get things wrong and it says things that are wrong about people uh, if it manages to crawl things like for example it got my date of birth wrong even though i probed it i'm sh i'm sure it's been programmed not to get my date of birth right but do you think it's going to get squeezed so much that it can't really uh, crawl any personally identifiable information just so if it gets it wrong it could be sued uh, you know, that's that's another very interesting part of how do you regulate in a legally kind of uh, enforceable way the usage. Now, I think again we are quite far away from effective regulation. Uh, so, for example, if you just look at software, quite often liability is is. You know, signed away by the companies producing software uh, to a large extent. And I see the same applies at the moment to AI. And there is clearly a need, especially much more with AI, perhaps, uh, than with just regular software. But of course, you know, the problem is that more you regulate, less progress you get. Uh, so if you look at you know, the pharma industry, which was much more lightly regulated until the late 60s, and which produced a um, much wider pipeline of new drugs, because the problem was that some of these um, were not that good and had bad, bad side effects. As a result, they changed the regulatory environment. So now in order to get a drug out, you spend, need to spend 100 million pounds before it is really tested. So on one side, we got much more safety, but on the other side, the number of pipelines is much, much smaller. Now, if you would apply a similar approach to software or AI, the danger is that you would just narrow down the, the pipeline for development. I think that currently, um, perhaps it's better to keep it as it is, perhaps less regulation, lighter regulation. We'll see. There is the kind of regulatory competition between EU and US and other countries. Where that will lead, in uh, which country will be able to generate more novel services and uh, achieve a quicker development of new innovative ideas and applications. My guess is that probably the American way uh, will lead to more. 
Yeah, it's interesting that the way the EU is going, they do seem to have the clouds to be able to rein against some of the US Californian advancements. If you look at things like GDPR, that's very much on the side of citizen. I think there's new uh, approaches to a digital identity that the EU wants to roll out. They, they want to roll out a digital identity for every citizen to allow them to be able to freely move. It's unnatural. If you want free movement in the EU, you've got to break down the existing practices, the different ways of doing things. So it's interesting that even the UK tried the digital identity system and it failed because of one blog post. Someone yeah. said the UK government wants to spy on you <laughs> and and it was it was killed. So it's interesting the the power of the EU block. And you'll see people from the US will actually say that uh, that it is powerful enough to be able to change approaches. So I, I think that that coming together of the countries may may really influence and maybe they're looking for a more European approach to yeah. data governance. But you know, another way of doing it is that they don't adopt it uh, formally. They adopt it as a kind of piggybacking on, on yeah. the EU. Let the EU over-regulate itself and adopt <laughs> bits that fit them. Yeah, yeah. I think that's... So, that's that uh, because that, so they, you know, I think regulation is important. More regulation will be needed. The question is how fast to progress with it and how to do it. It's a lot of it is not known. Overdoing it certainly it would be bad. But on the other side, you also need to look at uh, you know China, where regulation works very differently. And certain things are you know, the company works for the state much more is allowed to them than if they don't. Yeah. And when it comes to large language models, how disruptive do you think it will be for education? So at school level, really LLMs can wipe out virtually every topic. And I've seen research that goes right up to honours and even PhD yeah. level. Uh, so how disruptive in the next five years? Uh, how do you see our education changing in, in its approach and how we deal with these LLMs? You know, I see that it, it will change. You know, what I see is that, you know, there was a Wikipedia at one moment which had a lot of data and students would just go on the Wikipedia and search on it and find things. But of course, that was much more limited. Uh, now, you have a much, much wider version of that, which you don't need to actually go there and search. You just ask and it tells you the answer. So it's much easier to operate with. But essentially, it is, again, a similar thing. Uh, and again, if you go back historically, you know, if you take for example, newspapers, which became popular in late 18th century to the mid 19th century. They offered a lot of information that was not available before. And it led to quite significant changes in society, which you know, one of the main impact was the revolutions around um, from the late uh, 1840s around 1845 to 1851 and so on, um, which really changed how society was organized, how people identified themselves. Now, social media had a quite significant effect in that sense. So if you look at the use of social media in revolutions uh, in the last couple of decades, uh, and also the use of social media in cracking down on this. Um, so there, there are significant changes and I think that the chat GPT and similar AI uh, large language models um, will contribute in some similar ways so they give much more access to, to existing knowledge much easier way of, um, of dealing with it now in the context of education because that means that Answering questions 
this becomes much easier because you no longer need to have the answers in your head. You just ask the question, do you get the answer? So it will change how we educate. Now I see on my children that you know they read much less. You know, sometimes barely read. Uh, and I know I ask my students at the university many years now, and some of the students just don't read. I remember once I was at a, you know, a dinner and um, it, it was at Newcastle University and you know, we were talking about who read what and so now that there was a lady at the table who has not read a book for several years. So, and this was you know, sorry, 10 years ago. Uh, so anyway, the, the ways how we deal with knowledge has changed a lot, and ChatGPT and similar models will accelerate that change. And that changes how education can work as well. Now, how, how fundamental that change will be, I don't know. Um, you know. It's easier to access this knowledge, but I expect that What's going to happen is that it will be a different way of assessing knowledge, uh, starting from um, schools uh, and, of course, at universities as well. Because on one side, I think we should see the benefits as well of this kind of easy access to, to knowledge. We also need to see the limitations that sometimes that easy access leads to uh, rubbish as well. So it's a question of how you filter that out. But on the other side, um, if accessing this knowledge, which previously you had to keep in your mind, or you had to have enough you know, books around you, uh, like myself, so you could pick the right book when you want to uh, remember something. Now, that that is made easier. In a sense, continues the democratizing of knowledge. And you don't need to have a library. You have access to a lot of knowledge if you want. But that doesn't change the need for knowledge. Uh, you know, as we mentioned before, if you want to write uh, software, ChatGPT and similar, even specialized software development, uh, large language models can help. But it's only a help. It gives you an initial idea. The same way is with knowledge. Yes, it will bring a lot to you. But if you really want to understand something, if you really want to elaborate, on, you will need to read and do your own um, investment of time to, to learn more about that. So, so I don't think that we will be relying on it for knowledge um, in a very deep way. But superficially, it means that many people can access and can use a much wider range of knowledge than before. Yeah, I know it's not yeah. exactly answering your question. Yeah. no, that 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 makes sense. Uh, I've been reading a lot about uh, 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 ChatGPT creating multiple versions of code that an that answer a certain problem, but when it comes to the cybersecurity threat they struggle because they don't understand the context of how the program might be used. And I think that is obviously an area that they need to develop. And that often needs human skills of understanding how to, how to do things bad or how yeah. it might be used. There was a case, I can't remember exactly, when it was before COVID, so kind of like four or five years ago. There was a very well-meaning American, I think it was a teenager, who wanted to have at that time, the Iranian young people who were protesting against the regime. And the guy bought um, some mobile application and said that, oh, this is really fantastic and secure and so on. And it turned out that it wasn't so secure. It was easily hackable. And people who used it were caught uh, that they were messaging against the regime there. And, you know, what that points to is that Yes, you know, you can generate kind of code which might have some security features, but really, if it's 
generated based on you know, commonly accessible code, which is not necessarily very high quality, then you will not anything, not get a, a very good result. And then you need really the expert who knows how to check for security flows, how to fix those, how to write the proper code that is much more secure. Right? So then I, I think that large language models help. Perhaps they may increase productivity, although that again, perhaps is again is questionable because the question is how much time you need to spend on fixing uh, the bugs that are there in the code generated by the large language model. But it will shift the emphasis of the work from perhaps the more boring um, development of, of, of rather simple code to focus on the parts of the code that require more expertise and more deeper understanding. Yep. That's interesting. And, and probably for us, you learn throughout your research career, you learn what's important. You learn that publishing high quality papers is better than publishing a large quantity of papers. What advice would you give to an early career researcher about the things? They've just finished their PhD and you know there's that happy time that you finish your PhD and you're now taking up an academic post and you're trying to find your way. Should you continue your research or should you find something new? What advice would you give them about that, those first few years? Uh, yeah. I think that in general, if they started and spent several years on, on one topic, probably there is more work in that topic that uh, could be explored and investigated and written up and let possibly use them to to generate new papers, grants, possibly new inventions, patents, and so on. So I think that continuing that in most cases is probably advisable. However, at the same time, the researcher needs to gain independence as well. So you need to break away to some extent from the line that was set by the supervisor. And again, how far away you break away, that's a question. So in, in my case, uh, you know, I, I got into many new things, uh, but that's not, not necessarily always uh, a good idea because uh, if you don't continue the work that you, where you have an established name, where you have established connection, it can be difficult to build up um, new connections uh, and new uh, new reputation in another field. But it does happen quite regularly. Although I would say that perhaps in the initial years, the best is to continue and become an even deeper expert and an independent expert in the area where you already have a reputation and expertise. And gradually, then you can open up and see where other areas you may branch out to, to into. Yeah. But certainly, I think that, as you said, quality is far more important than quantity. I remember when I was in Netherlands, the, my supervisor said that if you don't work at least a year on, on a paper, it's probably not ready. <laughs> Of course, you know, it depends on the, the Dutch. The Dutch <clears throat> approach is like that. Yeah, the Dutch and Belgium yes. approach is very much that, very scientific. Because the ancient scientists and engineers had that approach. Yeah. Uh, you know, clearly, in some areas, <clears throat> the, the speed of generation of output is much quicker. So in chemistry, where you do one experiment, do it properly, generate data, analyze it, you may generate papers um, perhaps within a few months rather than a year. Um, but in general, I think um, it's much better to focus on high quality papers, which are published in selective venues rather than not so interesting papers, which can be published easily in not selective venues. Especially, I think that one practice is that is um, around 
in many places is to publish in journals where you pay publication charges. Of course, you know, there is a conflict of interest in these journals because on one side, they want to publish more, so they generate more revenue. On the other side, they also want to provide good quality, but in unfortunately, in many cases, the, the compromise ends up on the less quality and more, more publication side. So they publish too easily. And then one other indicator that sometimes you see these papers, people publish lots of papers, and you see that they submit the paper and this amount of paper gets accepted. Now, clearly, means that there was not much uh, reviewing done. Uh, so they not not much quality reviewing. So then it, in general, I advise my PhD students and postdocs to, to not publish too much, but publish enough. Look at the area of science where they work, see who are leading paper, how, what is their publishing practices, if, if it's they already don't know that, and kind of find the right uh, amount of publishing. So typically, in the areas where I work, I advise my PhD students to aim to publish about one journal paper and maybe three, four conference papers within the three years of the PhD. Some of them manage more, but typically most of them manage that much. And that gives you, I think, a reasonable standing. Yeah. But of course, you know, if you work in bioinformatics, that's a much higher speed area where I have some collaborations and I have worked as well. And there, probably it's much higher the number of papers uh, that you have. Yeah. Well, on the other end, if you work in um, kind of um, pure mathematics, there, you know, we publish a good paper in a highly selective journal every other year, that might be just perfectly good performance. Okay, so okay. one of the one of the flaws with academia is that we tend to silo all our subject areas. We have campuses and we have departments and we have groups and so on. And you're very lucky to be able to bring together quite disparate areas around computing engineering and the built environment. So what opportunities do you think that this new collaboration or synergy might bring for our research and our teaching? I think that, as you say, uh, it is really great to to bring together computer science, v areas of engineering, and the built environment, including architecture, technology, and surveying, and others. Uh, I think that, there, of course, there are other similar schools, faculties elsewhere as well. I think that one thing that perhaps makes us unique is that we really mean to have no barriers. Yes, we have kind of department subjects, uh, but we aim to have a kind of no barrier uh, ability of crossing between these units, between the research centers and so on, and we mean it. Now, of course, others might try as well, but I think that we really managed to set up this school in a way where the cross collaboration across parts of the school uh, is very much encouraged. We have mechanisms to support it. We have mechanisms to break, break down the barriers if those are built up. Uh, and when I see the, you know, the key opportunities there, both in research and, uh, and teaching sense, is you know, what we named a kind of broad sense Industry 4.0 integration is that you know, really, there are many interface areas which you know, they are there, they're growing uh, and you know, there are conferences or journals in those areas. But um, quite often those are uh, limited to groups of people at various universities. Now, we, at one university, we bring together uh, the, the researchers and colleagues in all these areas. And we promote uh, the, the integration and the collaboration across this area. So I expect that really, the, if you think of, for example, uh, application of cybersecurity and AI in the context of the built environment, where the new houses are kitted out with sensors, 
if you do that in a siloed way, you the the cybersecurity of the sensor systems is an afterthought. Now, if we integrate, then we can do that in a way where that's part of it from design. Uh, how you analyze the data in that contact again may come after you built it. Now, if we are working together with our AI colleagues, that again may come from the design stage. And where I think that really that, that make, makes the difference is that um, if, if you think in terms of designing systems and building systems, if you think from the perspective of the functionality of the system, if you integrate it, you see the functionality better, you see more aspects of the functionality, and then you can design the system around this functionality. So if you like, kind of, you build the software of the system and you design the system around the software rather than reverse, which is a traditional way that you build the system and then you design the various services, if you like, the kind of broad sense, the software of the system. Uh, that is the add-on. Now, we can reverse that. And I think that that, that is a quite fundamental change. Now, you know, to give you two examples you know, of the practical examples where this happened in the last 20 years, one is the iPhone, which revolutionized how the mobile phones work, because it put at the center the functionality of the iPhone, and they built the system around it to deliver that functionality. And I think that the other case is the Tesla, which is, again, it is, it is a car, but it is a car built around the functionality that they designed to be delivered. And in, a, in both cases, what you see is that this novel approach to the system design leads to a very rapid success of the new, new way of the design. Now, I think that this is the kind of general approach that we can facilitate in the school, which means that potentially we can find really a fundamentally new ways of building systems. But I think that we are, of course, we do quite fundamental research as well, but we do a lot of applied research. We are really prizing our work with industry. So building systems, in, in a, again, it's a broad way. The system might be not necessarily a physical system, but building these systems is one of our strengths. And integrating across these areas puts us in a position where we can design and help companies design much better systems than what are available today. So, you know, that's perhaps too high level, but bringing it back to the, uh, the kind of more concrete things, what I expect is that we will be able to develop new research, like, you know, in the digital twin area, where we bring together the digital twin approach, but together with cyber security, together with AI, with energy, or with transport. So again, new systems uh, in an integrated approach. Or if you look at engineering, uh, how you harvest energy in a kind of micro scale, how you use that to, to, to power relatively larger uh, services, be that sensor systems or delivery sensor, then it, we can facilitate that and we can bear this. Then I think that one area where this leads is kind of small footprint engineering, where we look at, again, engineering systems, but engineering systems first by looking at what's the functionality that you need to deliver and how you build these relatively small systems in that space or you know, implants uh, or other relative small scale engineering, microelectronics, and so uh, where we can change uh, the way how these are designed, how they are built and used. And as, as I said, in parallel, the fundamental research is very important as well. We should not forget about that, but we need to integrate that into this you know, outward facing uh, application driven. Great. And in terms of if you had a crystal ball and you looked 10 years into the future, 
and looked at the school or looked at the university, well, what what would they look like then? Well, you know, what I would like to see, I'd say 10 years from now, is that we are really a highly visible research-driven unit, in particular in the School of Computing Engineering and Built Environment, where we have a good set of strategic industrial collaboration, which means that we have industrial partners who see us as a trustworthy partner where they can invest and they benefit from that investment. So they can take out sufficient from that investment to regenerate the investment because they see the benefits of it. Uh, so I think really, if we are successful in this integration and we can deliver the growth that we aim for, then we can become a highly successful worldwide uh, research unit across this broad industry 4.0 area. Now, and then there, are, there are examples uh, of this kind of transformation. I think that the best that I came across, came, you may say that that's, that's a bit high aiming, but uh, I think that it's important to see high examples. So that, that is Stanford. You know, Stanford yeah. was you know, a good university, but it was just one of the many similarly good universities. And then it had a president who managed to have mobilized the funding to transform Stanford from one of the many into one of the very few top universities. Now, that kind of trajectory is what I think that we should be aiming for. Okay, perhaps at different scale, in different part of the world, but that that transformation change where we become one of the leading uh, research units. I, I agree with the example of Stan, Stanford when you think Google, Cisco, many companies, uh, people went to study there because they knew that it was applied and there was practice and then they were given the opportunity to really uh, expand where in places like MIT then it was much more academic in, in its scope and I think Stanford had that great and still has that great entrepreneurial ethic. So I, I wonder how the, there's this idea that Mark Logan is, is promoting just now about the entrepreneurial campus and obviously Scotland has a long track record and Edinburgh brought the enlightenment to the whole world at one time and it's a beautiful city and a great city so how, how do you see an entrepreneurial campus developing is it about students is it about our academics what, what is it that will make us more entrepreneurial well, that's a good question. I know that the government, Scottish government, came out a full new policy on it uh, of, of of developing the entrepreneurial campus. I think that, you know, clearly that's something that we need to do. But how to do that? How to make it effective? Because you know, it has been tried in, in various guises by many universities. I have said I haven't come across uh, any so far which did it extremely well, perhaps with the exception, in some sense, of Oxford, Cambridge, Imperial, UCL, which are, you know, really, it's the golden triangle where there are lots of investors and go around and look for innovation to fund. Now, I think that that is somehow a key element of getting investors around. Because you know, um, you know most of the good ideas will not lead to anything actually useful. Um, so if you look at the uh, funders in the Silicon Valley, they invest in a lot and they hope that about 5% of it will deliver more than the 100% that was invested. And usually they are right about it. Uh, but that means that you need to invest quite a lot into things that we are not develop. Uh, now, at the moment, what I think, um, that was my experience at Newcastle, that 
where I was involved in three spin-out companies. And in the end, we needed to go to London and to California to raise the money. Now, I think that that is one factor that is a very strict limiting factor with all the good intentions that you may uh, put into uh, an entrepreneurial campus that if you cannot set up an environment around that campus uh, where the potential innovators can meet potential funders regularly, then you know, many of the potential innovators will lose interest. Now, I think that in particular in cyber, you are doing that in a pretty fantastic way. Because you know, really, I think that that's, you have the link to that investor world, and you have the link to their uh, companies as well, and you have the link to the academics as well, and you can connect these together such that, as a result, we have a regular pipeline of new spin-out company, companies coming out, and some of them make it into great companies. But in a, at the moment, I think that in our case, this depends uh, very critically on you uh, being there and knowing all these elements of a successful entrepreneurial environment. Now, how we can scale that? Don't, I don't know if we have the answer yet. But I think that that is what we need to do. We need to have this connectivity between the companies, the, uh, the, the investor world, and the academics, so that if they come up with a good idea, we can find a way of funding. And some of them will succeed. Of course, you know, the environment that the university provides, it's very critical. Uh, to make it sufficiently permissive, sufficiently supportive, to provide the right advice. So, in a, for example, we brought in uh, John Ines recently, who has been sitting on the other side, listening to various people pitching uh, ideas to industry. And you know, that kind of knowledge of of knowing what how to pitch, how not to pitch, um, how to communicate with potential industrial partners. Now, that's very useful thing, and that's why we got him in, so he can talk to people. But, of course, you know, we have Nanik as well, who works with you. He has the same kind of uh, background from a different area. So I see that having these kind of, you know, there is Jamie, who was successful in creating a company and then running others. Um, so having such people around who can are willing to talk to colleagues, are willing to talk to students as well. Mm -hmm. the, the student and entrepreneurship, that's, I don't think that we do it as much as we should. Um, you know, we try. So, you know, I'm not saying that the university is not trying to support it, but I don't see it very effective yet. I have seen at uh, one place at Aston and another, uh, I saw it in um, in computer science at Bristol about 15 years ago, where again, kind of thanks to the right constellation of people, environment, and so on, uh, they were running really uh, programs where this, many students got into entrepreneurship, uh, they set up companies, and some succeeded. Not, you know, I think both cases is no longer uh, happening to the same extent because the people who were running it left, moved on. And if I remember in both cases, um, it was really just one person who was the key person who could link everything together. And when they moved elsewhere, then nobody could step in that, that place. So, so now I, I don't think that it's easily uh, supportable, but we are in a good position. We are in Edinburgh. Now, Edinburgh is the second most active capital market after London in the UK. Now, it's much less than the London, but the second best. Uh, 
potentially, you know, the government wants to have to make it happen, or whether the government has the money as well to support what they want, that's another question. But at least there is the willingness, and there is the policy that tries to push in this direction. But it will depend a lot on universities, how we address that, and how we effectively support it. You know, um, simple things like what kind of equity stake the universe wants to stake uh, in uh, spin offs I think that what we do here, about 10%, is, is fine. That's what you need. But I have seen other universities where they would be wanting 50% or 30%. And, you know, it just suppresses the appetite of any innovator to, to invest their time and effort and then take only half of it. Because after dilution, it's even less. But in a too greedy universities don't really have. Or on patenting, again, you know, it's... I, I had the case where I lost the grant because the, the officers at Newcastle were too keen to protect IP that did not exist. Mm -hmm. So, so they, they, these kind of attitudes um, matter a lot. They depend a lot on particular people who are in the decision-making position. So, so then, it's very difficult because in a just you change one single person in a decision-making position and can undermine the whole, whole setup. Now, yep. so I don't, I did not answer your question really, no, but no, I think I... that we need to move in that direction. I think there are many good examples and also many bad examples that show what not to do. Um, yeah. and... And I suppose it's finding the leaders of the future, identifying talent and to be able to mentor them uh, and allow them to lead. Yeah. So they take on responsibilities and it, it's not to do with their role or their academic post, but mm. they naturally lead. And it's building yeah. teams that can be diverse with their skills. Uh, and it's really trying to break away from this idea that all that matters is citation counts and yeah. general impact factors. It's what really happens to your research after you publish yes. and the impact it makes. What's the impact? Yeah. In a, yeah. And I see that in a, we did very well on that. Uh, certainly, it's according to the, uh, the, the ra last lab. But I think we do very well on that, irrespective of any assessment. If you just look at how many companies we generate, how is the impact of those companies and how supportive we are. Now, certainly, I think that at least recently, Edinburgh Napier did a good job on that. I don't know how was it before that, but right now, I mean, you know that um, impact uh, or entrepreneurship uh, ranking that came out recently where we are the 10th best in the country. Uh, that's really great. And you know, the other universities around us are oh, quite reasonably, so it, the, list, the ranking looks, looks reliable. Uh, so you know, that all indicates that probably we are in the right place, on the right track, but we need to do more and carry on. And and I suppose it's, it's, it's a fear uh, not to to fail or not, not to feel bad about failing mm -hmm. and yeah. and to 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 learn from failure and and sort of rebuild again is is key. You see it with Steve Jobs who 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 crashed, but he came back and he was a glorious yeah. leader. So I, I I think it's that supportive, and I think that the university has never said no to anything, and success can follow success. So if you can make sure that our leaders that are coming through. Are, yeah. are supported well, and when yeah. they do crash a little bit, then we're there to support them. I think yeah. that really helps. Something I like read, uh, well, see, it was something from the late 19th century in the US that you know, if you haven't been bankrupt, then you haven't done enough <laughs> business yet. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> okay, so the so I mean, I think the 
one of the people I've read a lot about was Andy Grove. And Andy Grove, although it sounds like an English name, was actually from Hungarian roots. So going back to your Hungarian roots, is there any great Hungarian scientists, engineers, artists that really inspired you in your work or still inspires you? Yeah, clearly, there are many uh, famous Hungarians. Uh, you know, some who I, I came across in some base, uh, at least reading about them. One is um, Leo Szilard, mm -hmm. who is a physicist. He was part of the uh, atomic bomb project in the US with several other Hungarian physicists. Uh, he wrote interesting uh, about um, about science funding and the, the world of science. So I liked his uh, novels on that, or the, the short uh, writings. Another famous uh, Hungarian scientist who I can find is uh, Pál Erdős, mathematician. Um, as it happens, uh, one of my collaborators has a collaborator he who wrote papers together with Erdős. So my Erdős number is quite small in that sense. <laughs> yeah. um, among the engineers, um, I mean, I know some names. Certainly Andy Grove uh, is, mm -hmm. uh, is a, a very famous uh, engineer of Hungarian origin. There were many others. Um, you know, especially in the, the kind of late 19th century, early 20th century, there were many inventions um, in Hungary, which um, quite often they ended up uh, in the US, where uh, they, they, those inventions became big. Uh, but some, some roots uh, can, can be traced back to, to Hungary in, in many cases. So, Great. And I just to touch on that. So some countries have had a brain drain and you see it in certain regions of the world. They lose their best engineers and scientists, as you see, to, to the US. How how would a country like Hungary stop that? So it doesn't make any sense to train people up to the highest level, to PhD, and then you lose them so easily. How, how can you make yeah, sure that I that mean, doesn't happen? I see that Hungary had um, you know some really good policies in that respect at least in the last 10 years so you know, when I said you know, I'm a Hungarian from Romania so you know, Hungary, my relation with Hungary is a bit indirect uh, although now I am also a Hungarian citizen more recently um, now, that's a, one program that they set up as I say about 10 years ago was uh, a program which offered uh, ERC grant equivalent grants mm -hmm. for Hungarian scientists who would be happy to move back from the US or Western Europe or Australia uh, to Hungary, and they would be funded for five years to set up their lab. As I said, that ERC level funding. So you know, that, that was really excellent. I, I, I know a few people who got that. Which meant that they could set up a lab, hire people, uh, and run it uh, in a very competitive way. A competitive at the level that they could compete with other worldwide labs in their area. Now, similar programs, so that was one program, and then they came up with a follow on program as well, where people who got that could apply for the next round of funding. Then it, these help. and. Now, in some respects, so uh, there are opportunities. Uh, so, for example, uh, at one moment, um, I was uh, asked whether I would move back or would move to Middle Best to have a department which had uh, at one of the best universities in Hungary with industrial funding. They had agreement with um, this one large company uh, who agreed that again it was a five-year deal that. They would fund it for five years. The funding allowed to hire uh, academics, pay PhD students, the stipend for students, and so on. So th there are these opportunities, and I think that that helps. 
of course, you know, the bit that doesn't add that much is how things are in the country outside of science. And if that environment is, is difficult, right? if there's a lot of political fighting, or if there are other, if there is corruption, and you know, that kind of undermines the attractiveness. Now, I suppose Hungary at the moment is yeah, they're both positive and negative things. Um, at the same time, the fact is that I know scientists who moved back and found their way of staying there. I also know others who then decided to move back to the West. But on balance, I know more of those who got the funding, found their way of setting up their labs, operating themselves, and stayed there. I know that other countries, for example, Slovakia has more recently a similar program. That Romania had much less, but they intended or tried to do a similar program. I think Poland has a similar program. I have some Polish friends. Um, so no, these countries are trying to bring uh, their best minds back. Uh, but, you know, there are many other factors. So, you know, still, living standards are not yet comparable to Western Europe, or the, the difference uh, got much, much smaller over the years. So now, of course, there are still problems. There is still more poverty there than here. Uh, but the difference is much smaller than, than or 20 years ago. Yeah, that's just good, good news. Uh, hopefully that there's some development. So my, my, my final question, and you hinted on this earlier, so... Let's not say that you would want to be a clinician or into medicine. If you want an, an AI computer scientist and dean, what job do you think you'd be doing now? Sorry, if, if I would not be... If uh, you hinted earlier on that you you would have liked a career into medicine. Yes. So let's, let's, let's push that to the side. Yes. So, if we exclude that, what, what would you be doing now if you weren't an academic? If I wouldn't be an academic. If you wouldn't be an academic. Okay. Well, uh, I suppose, you know, uh, among those things, two things came up in my life as a potential option. One was to go into finance. And probably today that will be FinTech. Um, and the other was to be kind of going into software industry um, and perhaps do AI related software. And I suppose, you know, these these were two options which I didn't follow in practice, but they were there. I did consider them at those times. But I suppose even today, probably these would be the two options that I would consider either going into fintech or going into some applications of AI. Now, fintech particularly, and of course you can apply AI in that context a lot. Uh, that's something that I will be probably most interested in. Yeah, that's great. Well, th thanks very much, Peter. I really appreciate yeah, you spending you. the time. I appreciate you You have lots of other things to do, and <laughs> it's probably been a, a long day for you. So thanks very much for, for spending your evening and having a, a great chat. So hopefully uh, I'll be able to speak to you soon. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.